In this lecture, we will see how to evaluate parallel program performance through benchmarking. Before we start, it is important to differentiate the act of benchmarking computer programs from testing them. Specifically, testing ensures that parts of the program are behaving according to some specification, that is, the intended behavior. For example, let's assume that we test that calling the reverse function on a list works correctly. We would create a unit test that instantiates a list with some numbers, and then check if the result of the reverse method is what we expect. By contrast, benchmarking is used to evaluate various performance metrics of the program. A performance metric could be the running time, memory footprint, network traffic, disk usage, or latency. Often, this value is a random variable. Its actual value is varied from run to run. For instance, if we want to test the running time of the reverse function on a list, we could instantiate the list, record the starting time, call the reverse function, and then record the time again to compute the total running time. At the end, we print the running time to the standard output. This is a very naive way of evaluating the running time of the reverse function, but we start with this for illustration purposes. There is one important difference between benchmarking and testing. Typically, testing yields a binary yes or no answer. The program is either correct or it is not. In the previous example, the list XS is either equal to the expected list or it is not. There is no other possibility aside from raising an exception, which is also considered incorrect. Benchmarking, on the other hand, usually results in a continuous value, which denotes the extent to which the program is correct. In our benchmark example, the running time is a continuous value, and will be slightly different each time we run the benchmark. We need to remember why we write parallel programs in the first place. The main reason are performance benefits, in particular, improving the running time. If performance were not the benefit, we could just continue with writing sequential programs, which are easier to both produce and understand. For this reason, benchmarking parallel programs is much more important than benchmarking sequential programs. In sequential programming, we usually only measure the performance of the bottlenecks in the system. Conversely, a parallel program is typically a bottleneck in the system to begin with. We will focus on the running time metric most of the time, which is subject to, first of all, processor speed. The faster the processor, the faster the resulting program. The second factor is the number of processors. A parallel program can, to some extent, distribute its computation workload across different processors. The number of available processors is the necessary precondition for improving performance. Main memory also plays an important role. Since processors are separated from the main memory with a bus, they sometimes have to wait while fetching the data from memory. Here, we differentiate between latency, which is the amount of time that the processor must wait from the moment it requests data from the main memory until data arrives, and throughput, the amount of data that can be retrieved from main memory per time unit. The two properties affect the degree of memory contention, an effect that we will study later in this course. To decrease the negative effects of limited latency and throughput, most computer systems today use caches. A smaller amount of high-speed memory close to the processor cores, which mirrors the parts of the main memory. Caches are usually divided into several levels, which allow the processor to fetch and modify recently used data without going through the bus to reach the memory. In doing so, they boost performance of a program by orders of magnitude. However, caches make performance analysis more complicated. And although they exist to increase program performance, they can sometimes negatively impact running time with effects such as false sharing. Finally, almost all programs coexist with or run within some runtime environment, such as a virtual machine, 
memory management subsystem or an operating system. These components induce effects such as garbage collection, just-in-time compilation or concurrently run other tasks, which also affects the observed running time. This is a very high-level overview of a typical computer system. In reality, there are many other factors that drive performance. For those who would like to learn more, we recommend the article What Every Programmer Should Know About Memory, which discusses these concepts in greater depth. As a consequence of different performance factors, it is difficult to accurately measure a metric such as the running time. Two runs of the same program usually have a similar but different running times. How can we be sure what the real running time is? Let's take a look at some measurement recipes. The first obvious approach is to repeat the measurement multiple times to get a sense of how the program behaves. However, this is not enough. Once we obtain a sequence of measurements, we need to do some statistical analysis. In the simplest form, this involves computing a mean value, variance and the confidence intervals. We can also use statistics to eliminate outliers, a handful of measurements that deviate from the majority by some large and unusual amount. To fight against various runtime environment effects, we should ensure that our program is in a steady state. Our measurements should be taken in a state where there are no concurrently executing programs and the runtime effects of dynamic compilation and memory management are eliminated. This usually happens after the program has been running long enough, which we refer to as a warm-up. Finally, we sometimes need to prevent anomalies that impair our measurements. Garbage collection can be avoided by allocating sufficient memory beforehand. And the JIT compilation can be disabled for the purposes of running the benchmark. In some cases, the compiler optimizes parts of the benchmark program that would not be optimized in a real application, because the benchmark is too simple. To prevent this, we often need to restructure the code manually. If we turn back to our earlier example, we can see that we neglected to do most of these steps. First of all, we did not repeat the benchmark multiple times, we only ran it once. Then. We did not eliminate outliers, nor did we prevent various anomalies, or ensure that the program is in a steady state before doing the measurement. One other problem is that this benchmark is so short for this particular list that the output will be very noisy. If you are interested in learning more about accurate performance measurement, we recommend that you read the article Statistically Rigorous Java Performance Evaluation. Having convinced ourselves that measuring performance is a complex task, we turn to an existing tool to do the job for us. Scalameter is a benchmarking and performance regression testing framework for the JVM. Here we differentiate between performance regression testing, comparing the performance of the program run against known previous runs, and the benchmarking, measuring performance of the current program. In this course, we will focus on the benchmarking features of the Scalameter framework. To start using Scalameter, we need to add it as a library dependency to our SBT project. We do this as follows. After that, we only need to import the Scalameter package and use the measure method to get the running time of a code snippet. In Scalameter 06 version, this method returns a double value for the running time. In this snippet, we measure the time required to convert a range of 1 million integers into an array. Finally, we print the array initialization time. So let's see how we can do this from the SBT interactive shell. First, we start the Scala console. Then, we import the Scalameter package. Finally, we measure the running time of our snippet. The result we get is 21 milliseconds. However, we run the measurement again. Oddly enough, the running time is now 10 milliseconds. 
This is quite a big deviation from the initial measurement. Let's rerun the snippet several more times. The numbers we get are quite interesting. First, the running time was 10 milliseconds consecutively. Then, for some strange reason, the running time grew to 53 milliseconds. This is quite unusual. What's even more interesting is that after that, the running time is no longer 10 milliseconds, but 7.5. We conclude that during this run of the benchmark, several things must have happened. First, JVM started dynamic compilation. The evidence for this is that the running time after this long run is almost always around 7 milliseconds, which is faster than before. Obviously, the JVM optimized something. Another thing that could have potentially occurred is a garbage collection cycle. During its execution, the program allocates more and more memory. This memory is deallocated and returned to the memory subsystem only after the memory occupancy raises above a certain threshold. When this happens, a mechanism known as garbage collection kicks in. If we scroll down a little bit, we can notice that this mechanism known as garbage collection happens very periodically, every third run of the benchmark. While the normal running time is quite consistent and is around 7.5 milliseconds, the running time with garbage collection deviates by quite a large amount. Initially, the demo showed two very different running times on two consecutive runs of the program. After doing more measurements, we observed several other effects. We noticed firsthand that when a JVM program starts, it undergoes a period of warm-up, after which it achieves its maximum performance. First, the program is run in the interpreted mode. Here, the bytecodes, which are the outputs of the Scala compiler, are executed directly in a software component called the interpreter. Then, parts of the program are compiled into machine code. JVM is smart enough to figure out which parts of the program are the hot parts, those that are executed the most often, and exactly those parts are compiled. However, it turns out that later the JVM may choose to apply additional dynamic optimization. For program segments which run really often, it makes sense to apply further analysis and optimizations to ensure that they are as fast as possible. And eventually, the program hopefully reaches some steady state. Usually, we want to measure steady state program performance. It turns out that Scalameter can help us here. Warmer objects run the benchmark code until detecting steady state, and they ensure that the JVM is properly warmed up before a measurement is executed. We specify the warmer with the with warmer clause, and in this case we use the default warmer implementation. Let's ensure that the runtime reaches the steady state before we run our benchmark. We do this with the following with warmer statement, which precedes the measure call. Recall that in the last demo, running time eventually became 7.5 milliseconds. We could have falsely concluded that the system reached steady state. But as shown in this example, when we actually run the scalameter warmer, the real steady state is reached. The actual running time of this benchmark in the steady state is between 4 and 4.5 4 milliseconds. In some cases, we are not entirely satisfied with the default parameters that the scalameter uses. For instance, the behavior of the warmer object can be governed with this configuration clause. Inside the configuration clause, we specify several keys mapped to different values. In this case, we change the minimum and a maximum number of warm-up runs that scalameter executes. We also increase the verbosity of the standard output. Finally, 
Scalometer can measure more than just running time. So far, we've seen examples that use default measure, which just measures the plane running time. Ignoring GC measures the running time without GC pauses. The outlier elimination measurer removes statistical outliers from the measurement. We can also measure different values, not just the running time. Memory footprint measures memory footprint of an object. Garbage collection cycles measures the total number of GC pauses during the execution of the benchmark. Newer scalometer versions can also measure method invocation counts and primitive value boxing counts. Let's see an example of using a different measurer. Instead of measuring the running time, we will measure the memory footprint. Memory footprint will measure the total amount of memory occupied by the object returned from the snippet, which is in this case an array with a million integers. Strangely enough, we got a negative value. This is because we didn't use a warmer to ensure steady state. We will run the benchmark several more times to ensure that some steady state has been reached. We can see that measuring the memory footprint is much less noisy than measuring the running time. The total memory footprint is around 4000 kilobytes or 4 megabytes. Since integers are 32 bit, that is, they occupy 4 bytes of memory, and we have a million integers, that means that we have 4 megabytes of memory, which is exactly what Scalometer measured here.